And so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Now, uh, Mark Harrison, who's a professor of history of medicine and director of the Wellcome Unit at the University of Oxford, was one of our speakers in 2009 when Shen put on a conference on immunity pandemics and how to protect yourself. And it's a real pleasure to have Mark back with his breadth of historical knowledge and uh, understanding of the context, which is the best place for us to start as we begin to explore this whole field further. So Mark, you're there, thank you very much. Let's welcome our first speaker. The title is Risk and Security in the Age of Pandemics. Well, thank you for inviting me and giving your attention at this relatively late hour. I think this is probably the latest I've ever given a speech at a conference. And I'm just hoping I don't fall asleep during my own presentation. <laughs> but I think this is a really important subject. And I'm really delighted to, to be invited here to talk about it. And although we have relatively little time today, I'm going to be around for the whole of tomorrow before I have to rush off for another conference on Tuesday. So if we don't get enough time to discuss some of the things that I'll talk about tonight, I'm happy to do so anytime during the conference while I'm still here. And if people want to, of course, I, I'm entirely happy to, to discuss further via email and, and at some other point. Now, I did write a lecture largely for the benefit of the translators. I'm not, you'll be pleased to hear, going to read it. Um, I'm going to just talk to, to, talk to my slides, partly because I really hate reading lectures and also because I think it would be particularly at this hour, more, far more engaging for me to talk in this way. But what Andrew was saying a moment ago is very important, particularly in relation both to the, the novel circumstances that the planet now faces, and if you like, the likelihood of a pandemic occurring, but also in the sense that we need to think about human beings respond to it, how they react in particular to one another. And so, of course, we can you know, possibly gain a good deal of understanding from looking at history, and I think that is true. History does provide lessons that we can learn. It doesn't give us certainties, it doesn't provide laws, but it can at least allow us to gain some insight into how human beings respond to certain kinds of crises. But we also have to be aware of the differences. And there are also some very important differences today in how we view the problem of what we now call pandemic disease. And you can see from just a couple of the titles here that there is a sense that we are living now or that we've just entered a new age of pandemics. That implies, of course, that there was a old age of pandemics, or possibly several older ages of pandemics, as there in fact were. I mean, the Black Death, so-called of the 14th century, the so-called Columbian Exchange, the transmission of disease to the New World, such devastating consequences, mostly the 16th century. And then in the 19th century, the first, if you like, modern age of pandemics, when cholera, yellow fever, plague, cattle diseases, and also plant diseases began to circulate the globe with a speed that they'd never been able to before. So we have plenty of precedents to draw on. But one of the interesting things is that the, the notion of the pandemic is one which is a very new one. And also the way in which we think about these problems is actually very different from the way we thought about them in the past. For instance, if we go back to the medieval times or the early modern period, by, in other words, say the 16th century, many people thought about pandemics as being essentially blows of fate, something that was sent by usually a vengeful god. Although increasingly they began to have a, a kind of natural 
and naturalistic understanding of how these diseases occurred. At the time, many people believed that, in a sense, it was fate that they were being, and they were being punished for something perhaps that they'd done. Now, if we move forward then, say, to the 19th for the 20th century, there's much more confidence that epidemics can be understood in scientific terms and that disease can even be conquered. In fact, if we look, say, to the middle of the 20th century, you'll find lots of books with the title of The Conquest of Disease or The, you know, the, <clears throat> the End of Epidemics and so forth. There's a great deal of confidence there, despite the fact that earlier in the century, in 1918, 1919, there was the most deadly pandemic the world has ever seen in the form of the influenza pandemic, or really three pandemics, which killed probably between 25 and 50 million people worldwide. But today, we understand pandemics very differently. Pandemics are understood, like many other things in public health, more in terms of risk. There's much less certainty about the nature of these problems. There's much less certainty about whether or not we can actually control them. The idea that disease can somehow be vanquished has largely gone. There's more of a sense that disease is something to be managed, something to be kept under surveillance, something to be detected at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, the centrality of risk to the way in which we understand these problems is, I think, something which has not been fully understood. I think it's really important. I think it's a useful tool but all kinds of consequences flow from understanding pandemic disease in terms of risk. One of them is actually that we relate to one another in different ways. And this goes back to the point that Andrew was just making. In fact, if we, we can see possibly that in the case of not just pandemics, but many other aspects of our lives, when we think in terms of risk groups, and we all are potentially members of risk groups, none of us are immune from this, that we are um, creating divisions between people. People begin to relate to each other in different ways. People begin to think in terms of, a, if you like, an ethics of liability rather than a sense of communal identity. And this is a very new thing, because even if we go back to the origins of modern public health in Renaissance Italy in the 14th and 15th centuries, you could see that there was a sense of social solidarity, <clears throat> a sense of the public good that underpinned the first ideas of public health. So these are essentially a collective ideas. And if you go forward into the 20th century too, the height of modernity, you'll see ideas of social citizenship, which stress the the, uh, the duties that citizens owe to each other in terms of health, in terms of preventing disease, that is no longer, no longer exists, or at least it doesn't exist in the same way. So we've lost something, and that's something that I think we need to reckon with. So in this lecture, I'm going to try to understand how things used to be, and then how things began to change, but also how the notion of the modern pandemic came into being because this is something that we kind of take for granted, that there is this thing that people call pandemics. It wasn't always like that. If you go back even less than a century, the term pandemic was hardly used in relation to uh, what we now think of as widespread epidemic diseases. It came about, I'll argue, as a result of an increasing interplay, a sort of mutual interplay between three things, between an emerging concept of risk particularly from the 1960s onwards, new ideas about security and making public health or trying to reinvent public health in terms of the idea of security, sometimes called securitization by some international relations theorists, and the idea of the pandemic itself. All these things, in a sense, made each other. That's what I'm going to argue. Now, these are just some things reiterating some of the the points I was just making about risk going into a bit more detail. I won't go through all of these things, but one of the things I want to make plain from the start is that here I'm drawing on quite heavily on 
the work of Ulrich Beck, who's a very famous German sociologist who's written about risk, the rise of the risk society, the global risk, global risk society, uh, but also some earlier anthropological work and dates back to the early 1980s. But to, in a nutshell, what most of this work stresses is that risk is not the kind of value-free, objective notion that we tend to think it is. It involves a lot of subjective judgments, even when people are calculating risks. And then when we move from the calculation of risk through to risk management, it involves even more selection, even more subjective judgments. I know this because I'm on my college's risk and scrutiny committee, so I know just how subjective the whole thing is. You know, there's a lot of discussion about this. But increasingly, it's part of the landscape of public health. Governments, national governments, take into account risk assessments increasingly when, it come, when they think about public health and pandemic prevention. They have national risk registers in which pandemics figure very highly. Global organizations, like the World Health Organization, for instance, base their um, response to diseases like influenza very much on risk assessments, both global and local ones. In addition to that, we have, and this is something which is barely understood, many private companies which make a great deal of money from doing risk assessments. So what you find is if you look at all this, that each country around the world exists in a sort of three-dimensional risk matrix in terms of pandemic disease, that countries are rated in terms of the risk of a disease emerging in their country, the risk of them being able to deal with it effectively locally, and the risk of it spreading um, from their country to other countries. And there are variations on this. Now, this is very different from the way in which pandemics were understood before. If we go back 100 years, say, to the late Victorian period, there was a sense that certain parts of the world were dangerous and that other parts of the world were civilized. And the big, the big question then in public health was, how, health was how to prevent diseases coming from the tropics, from places like Africa, or possibly from the Orient. All these places were stigmatized as being very dangerous. How to prevent disease coming from there to the so-called civilized parts of the world, like Europe and North America. Now it's all very different. Every part of the world exists within this kind of risk matrix. And of course, the, difference, the other big difference is that power is much more, much more diffuse, much um, more differently distributed than it was in the age of, the high, of high imperialism. Now it's not just America and European countries who are making these calculations, but China, Indonesia, every country in the world is doing this. And this is the kind of world that we need to reckon with. It's very different from all the rest of the examples we can look at and we look back in history. So this is something, obviously, I think we need to all discuss and take account of because it potentially steers us in certain directions when it comes to trying to manage disease or prevent pandemics. And we may have some important blind spots which have emerged, as I think they have. But also, as I said, I think it changes the ways in which we relate to one another. Now, this concept of risk and its increasing centrality in public health and in relation to pandemics is closely related to the rise of another idea in public health, both in states and also internationally, and that is security. So one of the things, one of the points that Ulrich Beck makes about risk is that it's productive. It can be used to do all kinds of things. And one of the things that it can be used to do is to manufacture fear. And then you can use fear for political purposes very easily, to manipulate people's opinion, to, to get resources for what you want to do, and of course to change the policies of governments. So you can see this, I think, quite clearly from this, uh, the quotation from Wolf's very popular book, New Age of Pandemics, 
basically saying, okay, I get it now, I'm scared. How do we deal with this? Right, so first of all, you have to create the fear, then you can do something with it. So the rise of risk and the rise of the need, the felt need for security, these two things go together. So first part of the lecture is what, what was it like before public health really began to think in this way? How did we used to think about what we now call pandemics? Well, the first point, the first point to make is that hardly anyone used this term a long time ago, about 100 years ago. Even now, it's a very imprecise term. Here are some dictionary definitions. You can see the Oxford English Dictionary um, really contains several points in its definition. One of them says a disease or maybe something else which is widely distributed, widely prevalent in a country, a continent or the whole world. Well, that's pretty much similar to what we now think of as a pandemic, but it's not confined to disease. Also, it's used to refer to common cultural ideas, social mores, morality. Up until the late 19th century, in fact, the word pandemic was often used more in uh, analysis of classical literature and poetry, particularly love poetry, than it was in terms of relation to disease. It's a very new concept. Now, even today, there's no clear definition of what a pandemic is. We all think we know what a pandemic is, but the definition keeps changing. The World Health Organization, for instance, uh, has changed its definitions sometimes, several times, sometimes quite controversially. Um, there is no fixed definition of what a pandemic is, even now, but more of a definition description. That's the term the, the World Health Organization uses. Um, but one of the things that I suppose we call it all understand intuitively now is that pandemic means a widespread epidemic disease and that we tend to think of it as being a very deadly disease that's going to kill many people. But strict, in, in, usually in terms of the way in which epidemiologists see it, that's not necessarily the case. Um, a pandemic can be confined to just a few thousand cases. In SARS, for instance, the SARS pandemic, which in some ways defines our experience of pandemic disease, affected fewer than 9,000 people worldwide. Um, how many people die every year from malaria? You know, it dwarfs that unimaginably. Yet, it's a pandemic. It gets lots of attention, lots of resources. Right? So the, the politics of calling something a pandemic is really important in terms of how we react to it and the extent to which it's resourced. It's not purely my sort of academic exercise to kind of pair these things out. These things have important consequences. Okay, so let's start with the, the kind of the, the period closest to us in terms of what we now think of as pandemics. During the Victorian age, you can see that in some ways there were some quite similar, similar situations that existed um, similar to today. All the the red lines that you can see on this map connecting the world were shipping routes, uh, trade routes for the most part, but also passenger routes. Um, steamships were used increasingly from the 1830s onwards. And of course, this dramatically cut down journey times. And so usually by about 50% by the 1880s. What that meant was that the world was coming much closer together, that it was united by trade. Also, diseases could spread sometimes before the incubation period of a, of a disease, which meant that it was much more difficult to detect. It created a lot of consternation all around the world. After some time, many people began to, to see patterns in the way in which certain kinds of diseases, like cholera, spread along trade routes, pilgrimage routes, and so on. And they began to figure out ways in which to deal with it, both by trying to prevent the movement of disease using quarantine and so on, but also by improving environmental conditions, sanitary reform, 
these two things, the environmental improvement and also the, the trying to track and prevent the spread of diseases were the sort of twin planks of public health policy. And it worked very well, particularly for the developed world. But during this period, although people were very conscious that the world was closer together and identified disease with that fact, they weren't calling it pandemic disease. They would refer to pandemics very infrequently, epidemics most often, or simply to the menace or threat of cholera. They wouldn't, they wouldn't think of in terms of risks. They didn't think in terms of pandemics. Um, but then, at the end of the century, that began to change. We have the first, um, if you like, modern pandemics, where the term was used increasingly to refer in the, very, in the same way that we would refer to it today. There are two things, really, that started, or two diseases that brought this about. The first was, the so was influenza, the so-called Russian flu. This was much more severe than ordinary seasonal influenza. It killed many famous people, including monarchs and um, uh, politicians all around the world. So it was no respecter of social class, and it seemed to spread very quickly. But this was also the age of telegraphy, a bit like the internet today. People were finding out quite rapidly how disease was moving. And this created a sense of dread, a sense of imminent threat. And here you can see on the right-hand side um, a telegraphic report, the latest on the influenza, the spread of the Russian flu. So people started to sort of track disease, even kind of ordinary people who could read, almost in real time. And this created a situation quite similar to our own where pan the idea of a disease spreading rapidly and of imminent threat to us began to really seep into people's consciousness. And by the late 19th century, many more people could read. This is an age of rising literacy of the popular press. And this is true not just in the West, but also in countries like India, which the British colonized, where education was beginning there to see people reading in English and also vernacular languages. So it was creating an environment more similar to the one that we inhabit today. The other disease was plague. Now, plague is, in many ways, an ancient disease, of course. We think of the Black Death, or maybe back even further to the 6th century, the so-called Plague of Justinian, which had important political repercussions, particularly in the Middle East. But plague seemed, up to the end of the 19th century, plague seemed to have been banished by science and sanitation to what were considered by most Western people to be uncivilized parts of the world. So that included southern China, Yunnan province, parts of the Middle East. These were known, to, known at the time as seats of plague. People thought plague was a disease which couldn't thrive in civilized countries. In other words, countries which had sanitation. But then in 1890, plague spread out of China, largely as a result of the trade routes the, that the British had created in the southern China as a result of the opium trade, um, and also as a result of migrant labor moving down to Hong Kong and then to other parts of what was then the British Empire. And then it spread from there to Hong Kong in 1894, and then to India in 1896, and then to places like Egypt and even Portugal by the end of the century, and then to the United States and to South America and to South Africa, there was no inhabited continent of the world that was not touched by plague. Between 1894 and about 1904, within that period, this ancient disease had spread all around the world as a result of modern technologies, the railways and the steamships. And of course, because of the reporting, it was, and because of its ancient associations with medieval period and the Black Death, many people feared it. It wasn't as deadly in the sense of influenza for most people in the Western world, but in certain parts of the world, particularly India and China, it killed millions of people. These two diseases together altered people's perception. People began to associate disease with what we call globalization, and they began to fear it in a different way because of new media like the telegraph. 
So this was the time of the sort of birth of the modern pandemic, if you like, and the term was used increasingly as a way of labeling this kind of, if you like, social experience of disease, this kind of anxiety about disease as much as anything else. And people, of course, at the same time, governments around the world were pulling together to create the first sort of global response systems, if you like, to this kind of threat. And after the First World War, after the, the influenza pandemic, um, the League of Nations Health Organization really is founded largely to deal with pandemic disease and created a kind of first centralized system for storing epidemiological intelligence. And there's a similar um, equivalent to that in, in, the, in the Americas and the Pan American Health Organization. So okay, that's, that's how things used to be. And you can see the idea of the pandemic is coming into being slowly. But it's not associated with, specifically with risk and not with the idea of security as we would today understand it. Now, I don't really have time to go into this, but there's one particular um, writer on international relations whose work I don't agree with. Um, is a book called Contagion and the State. It's written by somebody called Andrew Price Smith. What he does is just kind of create a, a sort of transcendent principle of security, which has existed, in his view, all the time since the, the, the Renaissance, since the Black Death up to the present. And he's basically arguing that, that uh, public health has always been largely about security. I think that is true up to a point, but it's also been about many other things, including a sense of the common good. That's basically the origin of public health. Um, but he also oversimplifies. Um, it, 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 won't, it won't go into this in great detail, but his, basically his argument is that after the Second World War, security became less important in public health. The World of Health Organization was founded. This was an age of liberal internationalism, and optimism, and people took their eye off the ball, essentially. And what he's arguing for is that in this new age of pandemics, that health should be re-securitized, and that it should be largely about border control containing disease, as opposed to environmental reform. These things he sees as being two polar opposites, whereas they've never have been historically. They've always been interlinked and mutually supportive. But that's his argument. Um, it's an argument I have a huge problem with in many respects, not least is that immediately after the, the Second World War, security was very important in public health internationally and for governments in all kinds of ways. Um, in fact, had it not been probably for the Cold War and the rivalry between the USSR and, and the United States in particular, that the international campaign for the eradication of smallpox would not have been resourced as, hev as, as much as it was. It's basically um, really fighting to win hearts and minds in, in countries like India, which were ideological battlegrounds. So at least that's an important dimension to the eradication program. So security has never been entirely absent, but it's never been entirely dominant either. Now, as far as risk is concerned, risk hardly figured in public health up until the 1960s. If you look at pandemics, this is a, I'll just summarize this. It's, this text is a bit small. If you look at pandemics in the interwar period or the late 19th century, when the term was increasingly used, risk was hardly ever mentioned. Only a little bit in the 1930s when people began to analyze influenza pandemic. Um, so it's something which is very new. People didn't think of pandemics in terms of risk at all. It really came in to some extent in the 1960s when the US government started to think about the risk of certain kinds of influenza spreading to um, North America from East Asia. Um, and then um, there was a risk assessment done in 1968 relating to that. On a similar kind of risk assessment in 1976, um, another pandemic was predicted, a pandemic of influenza. On that basis, the government of President Ford purchased very large amounts of vaccine and vaccinated 
about 40 million people. This proved to be very controversial because the pandemic did not actually materialize. And many of those people who were vaccinated, well, not many, it was a significant amount, subsequently developed some side effects. So it became very controversial this time. And afterwards, people were debating about whether or not it was possible effectively to, to model pandemics in the ways in which some people said it was. And even if you look back to the origins of pandemic modeling, which go back to a British epidemiologist called Major Greenwood after the First World War, he himself lost confidence in that method. Nevertheless, people persisted with it. So up until this point, in the 1970s, although risk assessments are being done in relation to pandemics, many people still did not have that much confidence in them. When things really change is in relation to HIV AIDS in the 1980s, but more particularly when we get into 1990s and the, the early, um, very early 21st century, when people are considering the implications of the, the so-called emergence of new diseases. This is why big, AIDS was a big shock because it was essentially, at least it seemed to be, a new disease. Of course, it had been around for some decades. But it was new in the West, and it really cr was a huge shock to people who thought that the major epidemics had been vanquished, essentially. Um, and for the first time, people began to consider um, the consider epidemic disease or pandemic disease as another potential threat to, um, to humanity as a whole, as well as to populations within, um, uh, within nation states. Now, AIDS did two things, largely, in terms of public health. It did many things, but two big things stand out. The first of all is that it did create a new sense of social, or, of solidarity and also respect for human rights, the respect for patients. It took a long time to come about, but that did happen. It created a sense of solidarity between countries to some extent. People began to look with sympathy upon you know, the plight of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there was a lot more health activism, which crossed borders as well as within borders. So all these things um, are kind of um, symbolized in many ways by AIDS and the, the posters. Here you can see a German poster which emphasizes World AIDS Day. In other words, global solidarity, a kind of cosmopolitan view which you know, exemplifies the best of what we now think of as global health. But at the same time, there was also a sense of division. The notion of risk groups was coming into being much more clearly. Also, disease was being securitized far more than in the past. People were considering disease far more than, say, in the 1960s or 1970s as a threat to national security. This, I've given you here some examples from UNES, the US National Intelligence Council briefing in 2001. AIDS and also other so-called emerging diseases are seen to be direct threats to the health, obviously, of US citizens to US forces serving overseas. Also, AIDS, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, could potentially destabilize states, including allies of the United States. And issues around disease transmission create friction with allies. Now, I've used the American example, but it wasn't just the Americans doing this, of course. It's actually this, this kind of way of thinking about or disease actually originated in Britain in the work of the British intelligence services. Um, subsequently, you know, all states have done this. So disease after AIDS is increasingly being seen in terms of risks, it's increasingly being securitized, to use the jargon of some of the, the theorists. Now, at the same time, there's a lot of popular anxiety about disease, which in some ways is intensified as a result of some popular publications and also the, the actions of some people, some, including some public health officials. 
Now, AIDS, and it's not just AIDS, but many other disease, diseases at this time, in the 1990s especially, like Ebola fever, for instance, hemorrhagic fevers of all kinds, um, seem to be emerging, seem to be breaking out much more often. And in some cases, there is even fear that they will um, spread and maybe break out of whatever measures are taken to try to contain them in Western countries. Now, <clears throat> at this time, many people are being concerned about what people are beginning to call globalization, about the large numbers of people moving across borders, about the loss of control experienced by national governments in an economic sense as much as anything else, about the, the effects of economic development around the world on, in, on the environment, including disease ecology. So what's happening at this time is that disease is crystallizing. The fear of disease or of pandemics is crystallizing many of these other anxieties, and people are playing on them. You can see this coming out a lot in the case of SARS, but something else has happened by this time. SARS and, the, and concerns about pandemic disease have been spliced together with concerns about terrorism. The war on terror and the war on disease are being often seen in the same way. Here's a, a quotation from um, a commentator in the National Review, uh, Review, 2003. He's saying, this flu-like virus, in other words, SARS is a warning. September of the 11th shows us the consequences of unheeded warnings. Now, at this point in time, New ideas are coming about, like germ governance. There are phrases being used like risk literacy. These are, in some ways, individualistic. Um, they're also really trying to ramp up the security rhetoric uh, around public health. And increasingly, states which do not seem to be taking proper security measures are being stigmatized, kind of like prior states which sponsor terrorism. Now, the legacy of SARS in terms of the kind of the division of the world into risk groups and so on, risk trades and so on and so forth, is um, clearly creating a lot of um, ripples during the, the 2000s, when we get into the, two, the, the 21st century. You can see it in relation to swine flu. Now, the global health movement stresses cosmopolitanism, a sense of solidarity. But what we actually saw in response to so-called swine flu, H1N1, was that governments used um, risk analysis to be able to slap protectionist measures on imports of meat, pork meat, and of pigs from other countries, even though the World Health Organization said there was no risk. It was used, basically, the sense of a global risk was used for nationalistic purposes, for commercial gain. A kind of sanitary protectionism, increasingly evident since the creation of the World Trade Organization in 1995. I'll just skip on to, to this. My basic conclusions, well, first thing is the, the idea of the pandemic is now a very potent symbol, um, and it can be used by all kinds of interest groups. It can be used by nation states to justify measures of protectionism. It can be used to justify large uh, importing of resources into certain kinds of public health activity, and so on and so forth. The consequences of this are, I think, that certain things have been left out of the equation. You remember, maybe remember earlier, I was saying, well, in the 19th century, many countries had been quite successful in managing epidemic disease as a result of tracking disease, creating things to block the transmission like quarantine, but at the same time, taking seriously environmental reforms, a kind of holistic approach to the prevention of epidemic diseases. What's happened now, I think, is that the surveillance system and the need to, uh, the surveillance has been accentuated 
the containment of disease, tracking disease, has been accentuated to the, at the expense of environmental reforms, the expense of looking very seriously at things like farming practices, intensification of agriculture at the expense of looking seriously at the overuse, sub-therapeutic use of antibiotics in farming. These are important problems. What I think needs to happen is that public health needs to be rebalanced. Surveillance is incredibly important. And I'm not anti-surveillance, I'm not anti-quarantine or anything like that. But what I'm saying is that this kind of risk and security agenda has skewed, or at least has kind of blinded us to many really important things, including the way in which we treat animals. And I think if you look at it even a much longer historical, from a much longer historical view, if there's one generalization you can make about human beings and their liability to infectious diseases throughout the human settled human history over the last 12,000 years is that each time our relationship with other animals alters fundamentally, that's when we've been most at risk from what we now call infectious or pandemic disease. And this is one of the big messages that's kind of been obscured. And I think that we really need to, to go back and contemplate that, as well as the consequences of thinking about, think, think of, of risk um, analysis for the way in which we interact with each other at times of emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that erudite and clear talk. We have to understand the context and to know where we're headed, we have to know where we've come from. You've covered an enormous amount of ground, and it's a wonderful start to our conference. We have five minutes for questions, and uh, we've got two microphones. One microphone. Uh, that's Nancy Gibson there with the microphone. Put your hand up if you would like to um, speak with Mark, ask a question, make a comment. And please do that. Uh, I'm speaking to... Don't be inhibited if you're a Chinese speaker. We want to work with both languages. Michael Wolf. Um, hi, Michael Wolf. Um, I'm just wondering whether diseases like diabetes, which seem to be gathering a lot of concern at the moment, do they classify as pandemics? Um, well, they, they can they could be classified as pandemics, but generally speaking, um, that's not the way in which they are classified. They're usually classified as global health problems. Sometimes the term pandemic is, use, is sometimes loosely attached to them. Um, that itself is quite interesting. As I say, the politics of naming something a pandemic or an epidemic is very interesting. Because if you call something a pandemic or an epidemic, and this doesn't necessarily mean even disease, it can be something else that's happening, like crime, for instance, you kind of attract a great deal of attention to that. <coughs> now, I mean, clearly, disease, a disease like type 2 diabetes is a global problem. Um, it has been a problem in the, the West for, for many years. It's even been a problem among certain sections of populations in non-Western countries for the you know, best part of a century, even in India, for instance. But um, I would say at most particularly most public health officials would probably refrain from calling it a pandemic because that's usually confined to infectious diseases. But because sometimes the, you know, certain groups or people rightly want to draw attention to the problem of diabetes, it can, you know, has been classified in that way. So I think you, you just need to be aware of kind of who's using the term, really. But I think it's probably not that helpful to use that term in order to understand diabetes, even though it is a global problem and even though it is related in some way to what we think of as globalization. Yes, my name is Kosha Jaber and I work as the president of the Global Eco-Village Network. 
Um, I would like to mo know just a bit more about what you're saying about the environmental implications. Mm. And I'm thinking of an example from Malawi, where um, schoolyards have been eradicated from all organic growth, all plant growth, over decades in order to um, work against mm. malaria. Yeah. Yeah? So now we work with organizations that are rebuilding schoolyards in a way so that they can, through permaculture and other approaches, to have very rich plant growth. Mm. Because currently, more than 50% of all children in Malawi have malnutrition and yeah. all the diseases that come from that. So to simply give them enough food and enough, you know, to reintroducing nature and wild nature, including all the growth that goes with that. So I would like to know just around the concept of hygiene hmm. and how we banish wilderness from our civilization. Yeah. I'd just yeah. like to hear more about well, this those is <laughs> areas from you. Yeah, I mean, this, this you know, that, that's really a lecture in itself. Um, even then, I couldn't really do it justice. But what is interesting, actually, about Western ideas of hygiene, how they developed, particularly, I think, in the late 19th century and the, the, well, for most of the 20th century, is that the idea of the wild um, was in some, seen in many ways as being antithetical to hygiene, um, with the exception of I suppose increasingly, say from maybe the middle of the 20th century, where there were some people who began to think of disease in more ecological terms. Um, there's some very interesting experiments to try to, in a sense, um, work with nature, work with the grain of nature rather than against it. And those include, you know, those are in in countryside, in particularly in this is particularly in relation to malaria, actually, any sort of vector-borne disease where there's a very complex disease ecology but particularly malaria. Um, so that, that it begins to come back in a little bit. But on the whole, I think the, you know, during what I suppose historians and sociologists would call the kind of the, the modern period, um, there's a sense that um, wild nature, along with dirt, has to be banished. But as I said, it comes back in, the, kind of the, the, what, the importance of working with nature. Interesting, if you go back a little bit, say, to the early 19th century or the 18th century, there are many people who even then thought that it was important to try to have some kind of environmental balance because in some way um, how you manage nature would affect the climate as well, and that in turn would affect the diseases. And that's sometimes meant getting rid of vegetation, but sometimes... It was about just trying to, to kind of work with it in, in um, partly, I think, because at that point, um, in many cases, they simply didn't have the resources <laughs> to try and clear everything away. Uh, but it is a very interesting history, and it kind of goes um, in cycles to some extent. But I think today, um, there are many malariologists in particular who who kind of value more of an ecological approach to malaria prevention. But that, obviously, there's a huge amount of, um, in some cases, quite bitter dispute among people who want to try and control malaria. I mean, there's some people who want to do it through quick technological fixes, and other people want to take ecological measures, and some sort of open-minded, they were pragmatic, they want to do a bit of both, wherever it works. So I think now there's a much broader range of... Um, views in relation to that. Thank you very much. Um, it would be very nice to continue with questions, but I said we'd keep to time, and knowing that some people have traveled very far and it's late. But um, I really think that uh, Mark has set the stage for us uh, wonderfully, and um, I'd like to thank him very much on behalf of us all. <laughs>